Good morning. And welcome to worship, especially a warm welcome if you're here for the first time or joining us for the first time uh, live streaming. A couple of special announcements for today. A reminder that tomorrow evening is our next Theology on Tap. We're doing that virtually, um, and the link is available in the email on last Thursday. Also, as things begin to open up, we're needing help with ushers and other details that are in the bulletin, so I call your special attention to that. We have two other special announcements, first from Debbie and then from Gail. Good morning. I'm Debbie Gardner, and I uh, have an announcement from the Mission Commission, Mission Team. <laughs> it used to be that in our other church, an old church. Um, usually on Mission Matters Sunday, the first weekend in May, we, do, we prepare 10,000 meals all together. Well, this year, as again, last year, that event is canceled. But we decided to do another event and plan a special field trip to Gigi's Playhouse Buffalo. It's one of the... Um, uh, our church helps to support this uh, worthwhile organization with volunteers and also funds. So please join us next Sunday after church at 11.30 a.m. for a VIP tour of Gigi's Playhouse Buffalo, a Down Syndrome Achievement Center. It's at 326 Kenmore Avenue in Buffalo. Um, the address is in your bulletin. It'll be in Staying Connected, and I'll give another announcement next Sunday. So please join us. It'll be fun. Well, this morning you're going to hear something from a female you probably don't hear that often, and that is, I was wrong. <laughs> when we set our budget last February for the one great hour of sharing, it was at my insistence that we do not increase our goal figure because of the pandemic and various things that were going on, that we keep the goal where it was the year before. Now, the year last year, we did exceed goal, but that would be uh, pie in the sky, I thought, this, this year. Well, I was certainly wrong. I want you all to know that the money collected for one great hour of sharing was $1,007 more than the 3,500 goal. So thank you all. Thank you to a very generous congregation. At this time, we'd ask the children to come forward to their dot. <laughs> <laughs> Charlotte, again, you're very brave. <laughs> Let's see. <laughs> There's another one over there, a little dot over there. You see? Yeah, move a little that way there, okay. <laughs> so, our, your verse for today comes from Psalm 100. Make a joyful noise to the Lord all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. So did you listen to that verse? How do we come into God's presence? Did anybody hear what? Come into his presence with what? Praying. No, not praying. Not in that verse. That's one way you can, but not in this. Yep. Singing. Singing. So the psalmist tells us that one of the best ways for human beings to experience God and to come into God's presence is with singing. And what can't we do right now in public much? What? Sing. That's one of the worst things about this pandemic 
is the, can't, that we can't gather all tightly together and sing praises to God. And so we look forward to that time when we can be fully in God's presence again. But remember, one, you can at home sing, and that will bring you into God's presence. So let's pray. Dear Lord, teach us to sing your praises. Amen. Okay, you can go with Miss Sue to Children's Church. May we join in our call to worship. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The Lamb of God will be our shepherd. Almighty God, you sent Jesus, our good shepherd, to gather us together. May we not wander from his flock, but follow wherever he leads us, listening for his voice and staying near him until we are safely in your fold to live with you forever. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Christ himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that free from sin we might live for righteousness. Trusting in God's grace, let us confess our sin. Almighty and merciful God, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against your holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done. O Lord, have mercy upon us. Forgive those who confess their faults. Restore those who are penitent, according to your promises declared to the world in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O merciful God, for his sake, that we may live a holy, just, and humble life to the glory of your holy name. Amen.
of us like sheep have gone astray, but now we have returned to the shepherd and guardian of our souls. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray for the illumination of the word. Guide us, O God, by your word and spirit, that in your light we may see light, in your truth find freedom, and in your will discover your peace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Old Testament lesson this morning is Exodus 15, 1 through 6. Then Moses and the Israelites sang this song to the Lord. I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. Horse and rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my might, and he has become my salvation. 
This is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his army he cast into the sea. He picked officers, were sunk in the Red Sea. The floods covered them. They went down into the depths like stone. Your right hand, O Lord, glorious in power, your right hand, O Lord, shattered the enemy. And our psalm is Psalm 100, 1 through 5. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord is God. He, it is he that made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. reading from the fifth chapter of Ephesians. Be careful then how you live, not as unwise people, but as wise, making the most of the time because the days are evil. So do not be foolish, but understand the will of the Lord. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit as you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves, singing and making melody to the Lord in your hearts, giving thanks to God the Father at all times and for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here ends the lesson. Our text for this morning comes from the Psalms. Make a joyful noise to the Lord all the lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Let us pray. Eternal God, still our hearts and minds that at this moment we might be open to your teaching. In your name we pray. Amen. There are many times when my ad lib attempts at humor can get me in trouble. Several years ago, at the end of a funeral, I introduced the last hymn by asking, Let, Let's everyone stand up and sing, even the Catholics the last hymn. <laughs> now I was attempting to have a small joke with the son-in-law of the deceased who was Roman Catholic and, and since the member who had died was a longtime member of the choir, we had talked and asked how important singing was in Protestant churches. Unfortunately, also in attendance in that service was our town supervisor, Pat Casilio, and he has not let me forget that faux pas all these years. I don't know how many times I've been fined at Rotary. And a couple of years ago, we had some difficulty, if you recall, getting the pavilion for our picnic in June. And Pat was very helpful in getting the problem solved. Well, he called me to say, Greg, you have permission to have your service at the park with one condition. You can only sing two verses of any hymns. <laughs> Well, these lighthearted exchanges reflect some real differences between Roman Catholic and Protestant worship. In March of last year, almost half the members of a large choir in the state of Washington became sick with the COVID virus after a two-hour choir rehearsal. Since that time, we have lived with singing being restricted. 
Now, the restrictions on singing during the COVID pandemic have been much, much harder for Protestants than for Roman Catholics. You see, hymns do not play the same role in Roman Catholic worship as it does in ours. Hymns serve largely in the Roman tradition as what I call traveling music. It serves to cover the movement of people during worship. The congregations often do not even participate much. Many don't even open the hymnal to sing. Thus, Roman Catholic worship during COVID, while limited, has not been fundamentally changed. The heart of Roman worship, the Eucharist, is received. But for Protestants, hymns serve a much more important function. The singing of hymns both teaches us about God and leads us into contact with God. Now our luminaries for today are two brothers, brothers who helped make the singing of hymns into a sacrament, no, not a, an official sacrament, but still a means of grace. John and Charles Wesley were born into a family of 18. Their father was an Anglican priest and poet. Their mother, Susanna, was an educated woman who would spend six hours every day teaching her children Greek, Latin, and French. The boys were sent to prep school and then both went on to Oxford. While at Oxford, they began to take their Christian faith more seriously. Charles the Younger formed what was called the Holy Club and with two or three others, celebrated communion weekly, observed a strict regimen of spiritual study. And because of this religious regimen, which later included early rising, Bible study, and prison ministry, members came to be called by others Methodists because of their method. John, the elder, came back to Oxford to teach, joined his younger brother in the club, and because of his gifts, naturally became the leader. Following their Oxford experience, now ordained, the brothers traveled to America and did mission work in Georgia. They both had less than positive experiences. On their return to England, both brothers had profound spiritual experiences just days apart that really deepened their faith. John describes his experience on May 24th, 1738 in these words. In the evening, I went very unwillingly to a society in Aldergate Street where one was reading Luther's preface to the epistle to the Romans. About a quarter before nine, while he was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation, and an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death." Unquote. Following the deepening of their faith, the brothers were invited to join another member of their old Oxford society in his work among working people. George Whitfield was having remarkable success as a preacher, especially in the industrial city of Bristol. Hundreds of working class poor, oppressed by industrializing England and neglected by the established church, were experiencing conversions under his preaching. So many were responding that Whitfield needed help. So both brothers began preaching around England in the open air to people who lived and worked in cities being developed in the early industrial age. John and Charles were alike in many ways, but there were differences in temperament and experience. The younger brother Charles had a creative and a poetic side. After about 10 years of being an itinerant preacher, limited health, some ill health, and a very happy marriage caused him to give up travel. Charles became rooted in Bristol and later in London where he preached in Methodist chapels. But his passion was hymn writing. He was said to have averaged 10 poetic lines a day for 50 years. Charles wrote 8,989 hymns. That's 10 times the volume composed by the only other candidate, Isaac Watts, who could conceivably claim to be the world's greatest hymn writer. 
Charles composed many of the most memorable and lasting hymns of the church. Hark the herald angels sing, and can it be, oh, for a thousand tongues to sing, love divine, all loves excelling, Jesus, lover of my soul, Christ the Lord is risen today. Soldiers of Christ arise and rejoice, the Lord is king. John, though, had different gifts. John had a very difficult marriage, so being on the road preaching was not a burden for him. <laughs> he also had a gift for organization and preaching. The Methodist movement at first was understood as a reform movement in the established Anglican church. Many of its followers would go to a, a Methodist meeting before going to the regular liturgy in the parish church. These meetings would largely consist of preaching and singing hymns. And since John was such a man of organization, he wrote rules for singing, singing hymns. In 1761, he wrote seven rules for singing, and I think it's imp I'd like to share with you four of John Wesley's direction directions for singing. So the first one, Wesley says, sing all. See that you join with the congregation as frequently as you can. Let not a slight degree of weakness or weariness hinder you. If it is a cross to you, take it up and you will find it a blessing. So Wesley encourages everyone to sing. Even if you feel you have a bad voice, even if you don't like it to sing, he says, give it a try. It'll make a difference. The second rule of Wesley, I would share, says, and I quote, sing lustily and with good courage. Beware of singing as if you were half dead or half asleep, but lift up your voice with strength. Be no more afraid of your voice now, nor more ashamed of its being heard than when you sang the songs of Satan. Now, it seems to me almost every church service you ever see betrayed in a movie the people are bleeding out the hymns like half-dead sheep. In one of the churches I served, <laughs> there was for a time an organist who played slowly and without energy. And so I went to a community event one time, and, and one of my members of the church was there, and I went up to greet her, and there was a big group of people around, and she said, Greg, some Sunday I'm going to walk down the center aisle of the sanctuary and lay on the communion table. Ethel, why would you want to lie down on the communion table? She responded, because if all we're going to have our funeral dirges played, we need a body. <laughs> we're not going to do that here. No. <laughs> the words in our hymns are about joy and forgiveness and the love of God. We, so we should sing with energy, power, joy, and tempo. Wesley's third rule tells us, sing modestly. Do not bawl so as to be heard above or distinct from the rest of the congregation, that you may not destroy the harmony, but strive to unite your voices together so as to make one clear, melodious sound. The singing of hymns together is not a solo performance. We are not to sing as loud as possible in order to hear our distinctive voice. We are to seek to blend our voices with each other. The singing of hymns is to be a time when the unity of the congregation is most pronounced. We are able to become one through the harmony of music. And the final rule in Wesley's directions for singing tells us, above all, sing spiritually. Have an eye to God in every word you sing. Aim at pleasing him more than yourself or any other creature. In order to do so, this attends strictly to the sense of what you sing and see that your heart is not carried away with the sound but offered to God continually. So shall your singing be such as the Lord will approve here and reward you when he cometh in the clouds of heaven. Wesley's telling us that singing is a spiritual act. We're not singing for ourselves or the person standing next to us. The audience is God. It is to the risen Christ that we sing our praises. 
and the words are important. Wesley says, don't be carried away by the melody. Pay attention to the words and how they express our faith. Now, some may wonder why I'm making such a big deal about singing hymns. And the reason is that music has great power. Plato teaches us that music is able to touch the emotional, non-rational parts of human beings. Music is able to speak to the inner core of our souls and connect with our primal being. Music has power because it is able to speak to the deepest needs of the human soul. And remember the psalmist tells us, come into his presence with singing. The psalmist knew that it is music that can lead us into God's very presence. The most beloved section of the Old Testament is the Psalms. And you need to remember, the Psalms were not written to be read. The Psalms were meant to be sung. They were the hymn book of Israel. St. Augustine said, when you sing, you pray twice. And I believe that participating in the singing of hymns can be of great importance to every worshiper, for it has great power to speak both to and from the depths of our being. For singing helps us express our joy. Singing helps us to endure the heartbreaks of life. Singing can help us understand God's love. Singing can restore our relationship with God. Singing can heal our souls. Yes, the singing of hymns has the power to become a pathway into the very heart of God. Now this sermon's focus on the Wesleys was planned about a year ago when we all thought things would be back to normal by now. The fact that we still do not know when we will be able to stand and sing out as loudly as we want reminds us of just how important singing is to our spiritual well-being. You know, kind of whispering into our masks along with the hymns is not, doesn't quite cut it. Worship will not feel whole until we can fully follow the words of the psalmist. Make a joyful noise to the Lord all the lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Let us pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks that you have given us voices to sing your praise. We look forward again to that time when we can come into your presence with singing. Amen.
Let us join together in our prayers. The response to by your grace, O God, is raise us from death to life. Let us pray. In the blessed hope of resurrection, we pray to the Lord of endless life, saying, by your grace, O God, raise us from death to life. Life-giving God, we pray for the church. Build us up in faith, hope, and love upon the cornerstone of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Let us be a living sign of your love for all the world. By your grace, O God, raise us from death to life. Life-giving God, we pray for the world. Gather up the scattered peoples of the earth Lift up the lost, deliver the weak from danger. Help our leaders shepherd the poor to safety. By your grace, O God, raise us from death to life. Life-giving God, we pray for this community. Translate our words of love into action. Teach those among us who have plenty to care for sisters and brothers who need our help. By your grace, O oh God, raise us from death to life. Life-giving God, we pray for loved ones, all those we now name in silence. Help those who suffer, Restore them, body, mind, and soul. Walk beside them through every dark valley. Feed them with mercy. Anoint them with healing. By your grace, O God, raise us from death to life. Life-giving God, we pray for ourselves this day. As we come before you and into your presence, we bring with us all our hopes and dreams, our disappointments and frustrations, all our hurts and all our victories, and we offer them to you, trusting that you would order our lives according to your purpose. By your grace, O God, raise us from death to life. Eternal God, show forth in us and in our world the good news of your saving power, so that all may believe and have life in you, through Jesus Christ, who taught us when we prayed together to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. <laughs> forth in the world in peace, be of good courage, 
Hold fast to that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honor everyone. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be among with you and remain with you always.